Today is uh, the last of our um, sessions uh, as we address the question, why the cross? We've had um, a couple of really interesting folks with us. Uh, Amy Peeler, by the way, if you didn't get to see Amy Peeler, uh, we had this unfortunate situation where we had a technical glitch and, and it wasn't recorded, but in her generosity, I said, Amy, could I ask you a huge favor? Could, would you come and, and do a, just an hour um, with just you and me, and we could, you could sort of repeat what you presented and we could talk about it? And she said, sure. So, um, so it's live now. Uh, so you can see Amy Peeler if you missed her. Um, it, it's not to be missed. She's, she is such a great spirit. She's an Episcopal priest, um, assistant uh, rector at a church near uh, Wheaton, uh, Illinois, because she is on the faculty of Wheaton College, um, teaches New Testament to both undergraduate and graduate students there. They have a PhD program there, so she teaches uh, in that program. Um, and But she's a real sort of, I don't know if you, those of you who were there saw her, uh, she's sort of very down to earth and fun and, um, you know, just just sort of a, a neat person. <laughs> then, then we had, then we also had Mark Baker, and Mark is, um, yeah, folks, just, um, yeah. if you want, just pull up another row uh, behind us here. We're glad to have you all here. Come on in. Um, and uh, uh, I, even though I may be talking with my back to you, I will turn around uh, um, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, because we, we are, the, the, the difficulty of this particular setup is that we, um, that, well, the challenge, it's not a difficulty at all. The challenge is that we want to include both the folks who are physically present and the folks who are digitally present with us um, so that the folks who are digitally present feel like they're on the other side of the circle um, from those of us who are uh, here on this side of the circle. Um, so um, we also, because of that, I want to remind everyone again that if you, if you are here in the physical space, if you want to share something, please make sure you speak into the microphone so our friends on the other side of the circle can uh, hear what you are saying, because that sometimes is frustrating for all those folks uh, when, they, when they can't hear what you, the wonderful thing that you're trying to contribute. So today, um, as we close this out, um, you know, last week, Mark Baker did a, a very unusual and interesting presentation where he talked about how the, the cross um, is portrayed in the culture of, um, I think it's Uzbekistan, um, and sort of more of an Asian, what is it? Kurdistan, thank you. One of the stands, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the, the, the uh, after 9-11, the New Yorker uh, did a, um, a cartoon where they did all the boroughs of New York and, and put Stan at the end of them. <laughs> So anyways, um, uh, so and, and then also he showed us a, a clip from the film Gran Torino um, with, um, gosh, what's his name again? Clint Eastwood. Who's Clint that? Eastwood. Clint Eastwood, thank you. Clint Eastwood um, and, uh, and how, how that sort of the, the images of the character Will uh, that Clint Eastwood played um, is sort of a Christ figure in a sense and, and sort of had... Uh, and metaphors for um, the cross. And so, so I think the point to make in all of that is there are many metaphors that we can use to understand the cross. Um, any of those metaphors um, are ways of getting at the truth behind all of that, the, the metaphorical images that we use, you know, like um, ransom theory or plenary substitutionary atonement, all of those things are ways of describing the truth that the creed tells us that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate for us and for our salvation. Um, uh, he died, was buried, and on the third day he rose again. Um, that's all the creed tells us. So anything else is metaphor because it's we have to try to figure out what does that all mean for us, right? Um, so I, I thought today, you know, today is Palm Sunday, obviously, for us, for the West. Um, next week, the Eastern Christians are going to be having their Palm Sunday. Um, so half of all of Christianity is celebrating Easter a week later than we are. Uh, we have to realize that we aren't the only game in town. There is there's an entire, you know, millions of people who are on a slightly different calendar than we are for various historical reasons um, and uh, who are still 
celebrating the same mystery that we're celebrating. Um, I, I know, for example, Bishop uh, Frank Brookhart, who we know here from St. John's, uh, has a great opportunity this year. He and his wife are going to be spending um, this week in the Holy Land, and they are going they are going deliberately at this time because they want to celebrate both Western and Eastern Holy Weeks um, together there. So, so millions of Christians in the next two weeks are going to be celebrating the cross. And, and we've been asking, well, what does that mean? Why the cross, right? Um, and uh, so, so the, but, but the most important question perhaps um, is not just the millions of people throughout the world who are doing that, uh, recalling these events, but I hope they're all, they are remembering them. And by that, I mean making them present for themselves, um, but also for ourselves. What, if the cross, the cross means something to millions, what does it mean for me? You know, that comes from a, a hymn, an Easter hymn, you know, for, for millions and for me. Uh, so what does it mean for you and for me? What, what is the meaning of the cross? And I thought we would start today by just looking at a couple of things, just little bits from the tradition to sort of spur our imaginations as we have some time together to say, well, what does the cross mean for you? Does it mean, and, and how, and not only that, and, and, and in our culture today, do you have any thoughts about how we can make the cross seem more um, meaningful to people in our culture for whom this probably seems like, huh? Yeah, uh, what's all this talk about crosses and blood and stuff like that? Uh, how, how could we maybe make it more meaningful to, to um, as an evangelistic tool to people who don't understand what we're even talking about, right? So, so that, that's the other thing we might, we might get to. I mean, if we, you don't have to, you know, but, but we, we might get to that. Um, but I thought I'd start by just um, giving us a, just little bits from the tradition about how different um, folks throughout the tradition have talked about the meaning of the cross in very different ways, um, which we've already talked about. Uh, I, I will say also, um, I'll share with you this resource that, that I love. Um, it's called Celebrating the Seasons, Daily Spiritual Readings for the Christian Year. Celebrating the Seasons, Daily Spiritual Readings for the Christian Year. Uh, and it also has a companion volume called Celebrating the Saints. And it has a, a reading from each of the days that we celebrate a saint in the church's calendar. Um, the, this, these are great volumes. I believe they're still in print. Um, uh, uh, suggest, suggest these to you if you're interested in that. But the first, yes, ma'am. Well, what we can do is we can put it in the um, resource page. Um, and Kelsey, if, if you want to put the resource, this resource celebrating the season, you could probably look it up online. Celebrating the seasons, daily spiritual readings for the Christian year, and then celebrating the saints is the second volume, the other volume. Thank you, Margaret. Well, the first one I want to take a look at is from, from an Eastern Christian, uh, eighth century monastic by the name of Theodore of Studios, um, Greek, Greek Orthodox. Um, and this is from his, his um, uh, writing called In Adoration of the Cross. How precious is the gift of the cross, how splendid to contemplate. In the cross, there is no mingling of good and evil as in the tree of paradise. It is wholly beautiful to behold and good to taste. The fruit of this tree is not death, but life, not darkness, but light. This tree does not cast us out of paradise, but opens the way for our return. This was the tree on which Christ, like a king on a chariot, destroyed the devil, the Lord of death, and freed the human race from tyranny. This was the tree upon which the Lord, like a brave warrior, wounded in hands and feet and side, healed the wounds of sin that the devil serpent had inflicted on our nature. A tree once caused our death, but now a tree brings life. Once deceived by a tree, we have now repelled the cunning serpent by a tree. What an astonishing transformation, that death should become life, that decay should become immortality, that shame should become glory. Well might the holy apostle exclaim, far be it from me to glory in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
the supreme wisdom that flowered on the cross has shown the folly of worldly wisdom's pride. The knowledge of all good, which is the fruit of the cross, cut away the shoots of wickedness. So as you might see from that, um, Theodore Studios is operating in what we call the Christus Victor model, that Jesus in the cross came down into, into the, the depths of hell and uh, bound Satan hand and foot, flung open the prison doors, and let all the saints of the Old Testament march out, um, uh, and, and, and Satan was foiled. That, that's the meaning of the cross for Theodore Studios and for, you know, for much of the Christian tradition. Um, here's something different. This is a, a, one of uh, the verses of a poem by uh, the Welsh poet R.S. Thomas, who I love, one of my, because he's Welsh, I love him because he's Welsh. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, this, is, this is the verse of the poem called The Coming. Uh, on a bare hill, a bare tree saddened the sky. Many people held out their thin arms to it as though waiting for a vanished April to return to its crossed boughs. The sun watched them. Let me go there, he said. There's almost a haiku quality to it, doesn't it? <laughs> Father Mark, could you read that again, please? Sure. <laughs> the other side of the circle is talking now. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's a short poem. Why don't I read the first part of it, too? Uh, you know, how's, how's that? Yeah. Uh, the coming. And God held in his hand a small globe. Look, he said. The sun looked far off as though as through water. He saw a scorched land of fierce color. The light burned there. Crusted buildings cast their shadows. A bright serpent, a river, uncoiled itself, radiant with slime. On a bare hill, a bare tree saddened the sky. Many people held out their thin arms to it, as though waiting for a vanished April to return to its crossed boughs. The sun watched them. Let me go there, he said. So, um, like a lot of poetry, it has a, like a lot of nut meat in it, right? Uh, that that, um, and and I'm not sure if it, of of all of the various ways of looking at the atonement that represents, right? Um, it's sort of could be lots of different things, right? Um, Mark, who was that? Who's the poet? R.S. Thomas. He um, was an Anglican priest and a Welsh, a Welshman and a poet. <laughs> or I should say a Welshman and an Anglican priest <laughs> and a poet. <laughs> When I used to say in school, what nationalities are you? In those days, that's what people used to ask in where I grew up. Um, and I'd say that, that I was both Polish and Welsh. People would say, well, what kind of a Welsh name is Kowalewski? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Have all the nouns on one side, right? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> right, I kind of brought them together. The, the comment was, I had all the nouns on one side, and all, or all the vowels on one side, and all the consonants on the other. Um, so this is this is something totally new and different. This is very different. This is um, from um, a book called Peter Abelard uh, by Ellen Waddell. And, uh, you know, Peter Abelard is the one who did the um, Jesus's exemplar model of the atonement. But, but this is really interesting because this is, this is from, from a, a, a book on Peter Abelard by Helen Waddell. This is, it's a story, a little story, okay? From somewhere 
near them in the woods, a cry arose. Oh, let, me, let me just say, you know, Peter Abelard and, and this huntsman, Thibault, uh, are out in the woods in a, in a little like hunting lodge or whatever. From somewhere near them in the woods, a cry rose, a thin cry of such intolerable anguish that Abelard turned dizzy on his feet and caught at the wall of the hut. It's a child's voice, he said. Thibault had gone outside. The cry came again. A rabbit, said Thibault. He listened. It'll be in a trap. Hugh told me he was putting them down. Oh, God, said Abelard. He muttered, let it please die quickly. But the cry came yet again, and he plunged through the thicket of a hornbeam. Watch out, said Thibault, thrusting past him. The trap might take the hand off of you. The rabbit stopped shrieking when they stooped over it, either from exhaustion or in some last extremity of fear. Thibault held the teeth of the trap apart, and Abelard gathered up the little creature in his hands. It lay for a moment, breathing quickly. Then in some blind recognition of the kindness that had met it at the end, the small head thrust and nestled against his arm, and it died. It was that last confiding thrust that broke Abelard's heart. He looked down at the little draggled body, his mouth shaking. Thibault, he said, did you ever think there is a God at all? Whatever has come to me, I earned it. But what did this one do? Thibault nodded. I know, he said. Only, I think God is in it too. Abelard looked up sharply. In it? Do you mean that it makes him suffer the way it does us? Again, Thibault nodded. Then why doesn't he stop it? I don't know, said Thibault, unless it's like the prodigal son. I suppose the father could have kept him at home against his will, but what would have, the, what would have been the use to that? All this, he stroked the limp little body, is because of us, but all the time God suffers more than we do. Abelard looked at him perplexed. Thibault, do you mean Calvary? Thibault shook his head. That was only a piece of it, the piece that we saw in time, like that. And he pointed to a fallen tree beside them, sawn through the middle. That dark ring there, it goes up and down the whole length of the tree, but you only see it where it cuts across. That is what Christ's life was, the bit of God that we saw. And we think God is like that because Christ was like that. Kind and forgiving sins and healing people. We think God is like that forever because it happened once with Christ, but not the pain, not the agony at the last. We think that stopped. Abelard looked at him, the blunt nose and the wide mouth, the honest, troubled eyes. He could have knelt before him. Then, Thibault, he said slowly, you think that all of this, he looked down at the quiet body in his arms, all the pain of the world was Christ's cross. God's cross, said Thibault, and it goes on. What is that, on? Well, this isn't the name of the huntsman. Right. Yeah. T H I B A U L T. It could be, I could be mispronouncing it, but. Um. So that's a very different um, uh, understanding of the cross. Yeah. Um, I always find that um, just that story very moving. It, it's just, it's like, wow, that's a whole way of looking at this that's, you know, different. Yeah. And then the final one that I have before we have a conversation is, is I think, is I think maybe the most wise um, coming from the great uh, the father of the Greek church, Gregory of Nazianzus. Why was the blood that was shed for us God's most precious and glorious blood 
this blood of the one who carried out the sacrifice and of the one who was himself the sacrifice? Why was it poured out and to whom was it offered? These are questions that echo within the mind. If the death of Christ was a ransom paid to the Father, the question that arises is for what reason? We were not held captive by the Father. And anyway, why should the blood of his son be pleasing to the Father, who once refused to accept even Isaac when Abraham offered his father, his father offered him as a burnt offering, and instead was pleased to accept the sacrifice of a ram? Surely it is evident that the Father accepts the sacrifice of Christ, not because he demands it, still less because he feels some need of it, but in order to carry forward his own purposes for the world. Humanity had to be brought back to life by the humanity of God. We had to be summoned to life by his son. Let the rest be adored in silence. Nothing can equal the miracle of my salvation. A few drops of blood have set the entire universe free. So maybe that's what we, <laughs> we can say is, let the rest be adored in silence. Um, but I, I want to just throw it up to you in terms of, you know, you, you've heard some of the things we've done about the cross over the past few weeks, um, talked about theories of atonement and all that sort of stuff. Um, but just in your own spiritual life, what does the cross mean for you? And we can, um, if those of you who are on the other side of the circle, um, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll acknowledge you on that side of the circle as well as uh, on this side. First of all, in true teacher fashion, you gave us a multiplicity of things to think about from many perspectives. The first um, part about, I can't remember, but one day you'll be my age. The first, oh, a little bit, okay. I've been accused of many things, but not talking too much or too loud. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first had to do with the evangelical spin on the cross, sort of. Okay. Yes. All right. First, I think I have to see the cross as an evangelical tool. So I have to accept that for myself. And then I have to decide what does that mean? So I think the cross, well, for me, the cross is love. So then I have to decide, am I taking this love in an evangelical fashion out into the world? Is that the model that I want the world to see? That I believe that love, um, which is true. Love is the only emotion I believe that's stronger than death. And I think that was what the cross said to us. The second, that story about the rabbit was a little unnerving, frankly speaking. I don't know how anybody else took that. But I think that the story also told us what I think of as the good news and the bad news, and for me is the conundrum of humankind. So here's the good news, God gave us free will. And here's the bad news, God gave us free will. Um, the cross for me is, it's interesting because I've, I've belonged to several Christian faith traditions and as a Roman Catholic, we really, I mean, this church as well, but definitely as a Roman Catholic, you have a very strong understanding of the cross because Good Friday is a very solemn, very moving service. And growing up in Catholic school, that was very prominent. And it's about the suffering of Christ and what he was willing to do for us. And I, I, that's one part of it. But what I got from him, and maybe that wasn't the intention, but what I got from that was also a feeling of guilt that I was so bad 
that he had to do this. And there's truth in that, and not me personally being so bad, but humanity in general, there's definitely truth in that. But there's also a feeling that I don't think we really experience the joy of it either. I mean, it's a horrible thing to see, but we should have joy because God was willing to do that for us. And it's a celebration of his love and his gratitude, his, his, his love for us. Being willing to do that for someone you love is, is, is unimaginable to go through that kind of suffering. And yes, it was a bad thing, but praise God, he got up. It wasn't the end of the story that there is something on the other side. And because of that, all of us can then be there. So coming from the Roman Catholic tradition, I had to get past the guilt <laughs> to be able to come to the charismatic tradition where they sing a song that he is alive and well, you know, and really have joy about that, but also not forgetting the sacrifice. Cause it's like the charismatic, sometimes they forget the sacrifice and they don't do good Friday services. You know, you don't get the Stations of the Cross there. And sometimes I would go back just for that, just for the Stations of the Cross so that I could understand the full, fullness of it. Who else? Oh. Oh. Russ. Yeah. Russ and then uh, Margaret. <clears throat> um, I'm just gonna go off in a different direction a little bit. <clears throat> There's a very personal part of the cross for me that I discovered as I got older. And that's that when we, when we do the right thing, when we are trying to be Christ in the world, trying to be all the things we're called to do and be that there can be a terrible price. And oftentimes we don't wanna pay that price so we don't get on the road. We don't, we don't get on the subway. We don't get on the bus. We just stay at the curb because nobody wants to suffer or die or but when we step out in, in the cause of things that are really important, and I'm thinking of the civil rights movement, I'm thinking of the march across the bridge, uh, there can be a, a terrible, terrible price. And we have to be willing to take a chance that that terrible price is gonna happen to us. But as the speaker right before me, because I'm having a mental block um, said, that's not the end. I might suffer a terrible price, I might die, uh, but it isn't the end. Because, of, because we are uh, followers of Christ and we believe in the resurrection and we believe there's something beyond this life. But um, to me, the message has been, sometimes you just have to stand up and take a chance. And if you get smacked, you get smacked. And uh, that's hard. That's hard for a lot of people like me who grew up in an English, Welsh, Scottish family where you didn't ever step out and you didn't ever say anything that might upset anybody ever. Um, but uh, somehow for me, it's that there's a price we have to be willing to pay. And I've had a lot of friends who stand up for lots of causes, but won't do anything about them. And I get, I get it. I'm not blaming them. Uh, but if we suffer in the end, um, it's not the end. And that just helped me a lot at a certain point in my life when a lot was going on. And that's my kind of off the wall take. As a child growing up in Belize, um, our mothers used to say, now Jesus died for you, he suffered, so you better be good because then you're going to be in hell. And so we were always in this perfect little, oh, sorry, Jesus. But the, at the age of 16, I, myself, receive Jesus in a way that his suffering, his death, his resurrection was a light for me. It became a light that every year when we go through Lent and it's Good Friday, we cry, we lament, and just like how we reenacted today, we reenact uh, the suffering, 
the cross. And it was, every year, it was a, an eye-opener. Every year, it was something new. Every year, it was something new. And then I moved here and come to church every holy week. And, but I must say that after I went through the formation class in 2010, it blew my mind because there was a question asked every Sunday, where did you see God that week? And it shows the good and the bad. And so for me, the cross is you see the good of Jesus allowing himself to die on the cross, to suffer. And the bad is to see that people cannot understand his suffering. They accept it as, oh, he did it, and that's it. I may be getting off topic a little bit. I'm not sure. But I was in a Bible study several years ago, and someone mentioned that the reason we wear a cross is because Jesus died on the cross. If he had been, let's say, hung, we would probably wear little nooses around our necks. And when you stop and think about it that way, it's very different. Um, will we feel the same way? I don't think so, because first of all, if you're hung, you die pretty much instantly. He did, that's not suffering. Being nailed, I mean, the thought of all that to me is, I think about that old song we used to sing, it causes me to tremble when I, yeah, when I think about, yeah. Because that is, that's suffering to have nails put through your hand, to, to hang, literally have your body, your weight of your body um, pulling down on you um, for hours out in the sun, that's, that's suffering. Um, so I, I don't know, I just wanted to say that. That's what makes me, that's what I thought about. When I think about the cross, I think about, that was true suffering. So much so, we don't do that kind of thing anymore. You know, it's, it's considered cruel and unusual punishment. We would never do that. Um, and I think about wearing a little noose around my neck sometimes. I guess we, might, we may have done that if that's what had happened. Um, and would it have the same impact? I'm not sure. It's just a thought. Well, clearly, you know, the cross was meant to, um, yeah, just one second, um, was meant to um, do that, right? I mean, it, it was a, it was an expression of state sponsored terrorism. Uh, that, that if you, you know, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome that historians always talk about, um, was built on domination, not on, not on like nice talking. Um, and uh, so, so we have to, to think about that. That's why St. Augustine, when he writes the city of God at, towards the end of the Roman Empire, um, talks about um, uh, libidium uh, dominatio, the, dom the dom do lustful domination, the dom or in the domination of the, the lust to dominate, and, and that, that domination itself becomes this, this force within us that we want to do that. Human beings want to do that. And that's the, that's the fuel behind empires. Um, 
I always get in trouble when I say that, including our own. Um, and uh, Abu Grave as an example. Um, but uh, but we, we human beings in the, it, it, when we get caught up in imperial structures and in the matrix of, of power, um, we, we become cogs in that wheel and it has a life of its own. Um, and, and that's why I think it, it's fruitful to talk about the powers of darkness uh, because that's really true, you know? Um, and and that, that Roman soldier that, you know, pierced Jesus with the lance or the one that nailed the, him to the cross, he was a cog in the, he, he was dealing with his own oppression uh, as a soldier, you know? Um, probably also cruelly treated. Um, so, so the individual actors um, were, were part of that drama uh, of, of the principalities and powers that, that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God, as we say in the baptismal uh, promises. Uh, since, we're, since we're touting our credentials, um, being Scottish and Welsh on my father's side, <laughs> and being Jewish on my mother's side, the, the thing that I think really um, strikes me the most about the atonement, the at one uh, at, at onement that we have in recon being reconciled to God, um, we see you know see it in early church you know in the way that the Gentiles and the Jews the law the wall of division was broken down between those two, and the church has always had. <clears throat> And as we as Christians have a calling to show the reconciliation that we have experienced in reconciling others, helping uh, being ministers of reconciliation so that others are reconciled to God. And I think for me, the, um, the real focus of the Christian life, uh, of the mission of the church, actually, is that reconciling. Um, it's bringing diverse people together. It's breaking down walls uh, that divide us, uh, whether it's um, sexual walls or social walls or racial walls or national walls. Those things, you know, the church is to be at the forefront of this because Jesus was our example of reconciliation. <clears throat> and the church has often been known for its conservatism it's reticence to break down any walls. It's reticent to upset the structure. And that is just inimical uh, of the Christian faith. And for me, I think that my calling as a Christian is to be, to attempt to be a reconciler. And um, that's what it means to me. Not a, oh, sorry. This is a sidebar, not a direct, but... I'm not sure who said, you, yes, you did, about the Romans and the cruelty, and that was a lesson. If you do this, that's what will happen to you. But I think we're seeing um, imperial imperialism, if you will, at work now with the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the soldiers that are just cogs in the wheel, some of whom have come alert and have now refused to fight and kill these Ukrainians, but it's right here in our face. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for more than myself. I can't watch the news all day anymore. I'm just unable to absorb it. And I found it made me very anxious um, it, it, to actually see what it means to destroy something, to invade and destroy. I think that we had never seen, at least in my lifetime, I don't know World War II, and we know a little bit about the Vietnam War, but this is just so right in our face, the, the, the destruction. So it seems to me like we're seeing imperialism and people that are caught in the, um, you know, a soldier can say, I'm just doing my job. You kill people. Well, it, you know, yes. I mean, it, it, does somebody understand? Okay. Yeah. Did you want to respond to her? 
Well, I was just thinking about, um, it doesn't really take much other than stepping out the door of this church to see a lot of people who are suffering like Christ did. And um, they're in their own special hell and walking around um, downtown LA and many of our neighborhoods, we're not safe and um, we're bombarded with a different kind of war, certainly not as physically abusive, but it's definitely spiritually and, um, and, you know, and seeing them as Christ, Christ is right there with us, looking at us saying, I need help. And it's heartbreaking. And it's, it's very difficult. Thank you for raising that because that's, that's yet another facet, right? Lots of facets. Um, you know, one, one thing I'll, re, I will, now that I'm thinking about it, responding to you, Margaret, and, and we, as we were, as some of us were joking about our, um, our uh, heritage, right? I, I, I was, I, I'm always struck by this in those, com when, when things like that come up, uh, because I know that there are some among us for whom that heritage has been made invisible because of imperial power. Because um, some, some of us didn't come here uh, on our own. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got an invitation we couldn't refuse, Felicia said. Um, uh, and, and do any of the 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 folks who are descendants of slaves in this room today have any sense of where they their their um, national background, for lack of a better word, um, is? And now some folks do know that because they've had uh, testing or whatever that, that are able to pinpoint things, but but uh, most folks don't unless they they know that, right? So that's yet another example of how um, that how we still are living with. The, the consequences of imperialism in our own nation, right? You know, just, just to raise that up so that. That is the only thing I find among my friends that are the descendants of African slaves, whether they have no college degree or PhDs, it is angering, <laughs> sorry and saddening and frustrating that you don't know where you came from. You just don't, I don't know my tribe, but you know, we didn't come here. I just say an invitation, we couldn't, couldn't refuse. We were not immigrants. We were um, not just prisoners. We, we were baggage, we were, we were chattel, thank you. We were chattel. And so we know we came from the east coast of Africa, but we don't know where. So we don't have that story to tell our children or our grandchildren. I can only say my father's people came from Mississippi and this area and probably one of these plantations. And my mother's people came from New Orleans, from this area and maybe these plantations. But I think it's the only thing that maybe um, the descendants of African slaves hold in common. It's very debilitating. It's, it's frustrating and it's angering that I don't know my tribe. I think, and you're right, a lot do feel that way. I don't. And the main reason I don't is primarily because of my faith. I believe I really am a new creature in Christ. And there's a saying, it's not a literal statement from the Bible, but it's kind of two scriptures being put together. That what the devil meant for evil, the Lord he used for good. That I feel 
that the intentions of the individuals who put out that invitation um, were not pure in any way, shape, or form. But unbeknownst to them, it was ultimately for my good. And that God put the joke on them for doing it. In that way, I, I have no reticence because, I mean, I do know of some African a place in Africa where I can go. Now, they were immigrants back to Africa. They were immigrants from the United States to um, Liberia. But I can actually go to an African country and touch relatives. I talk to relatives from this country. So I have some connections, but they'll be the first to tell me I'm not African. Quickly. <laughs> As will other Africans. So I don't feel... Um, I don't feel frustrated about it because I know I don't have a place there not like that. Even though I know my ancestors came from there, I know I don't have, my place is not there. My ancestors that were brought here were brought here for purpose. And they didn't see that purpose in generations down the line. And I don't completely see that purpose, but I know my purpose and my job is to execute that purpose, whatever it may be. Now, given the scenario, given how I was raised, you know, what I have here, then my job is to make the best and the most of that and be the best representative of Christ. And in that way, I will be doing my ancestors' honor. Let me throw this out, and I'm not, well, I'm just going to throw this out to you, because I, because I don't know if this, you know, and I don't want to, I'm saying this not to be presumptive, that part of what the cross means, I think, is that we have a tribe, we've become a, a tribe, um, we, um, we, we, are, you know, St. Paul says, um, whether you're slave or free, male or female, Jew or Greek, um, we, we are a new tribe. Um, and and um, that makes us all one. Now, now, that doesn't, I'm saying that not negating what you just said, Margaret. Right. Right. It's part of, a part of the picture, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that. And that means that we all sit down at the table here and we're all part of the same tribe. Mm -hmm. Can we see the chat? Uh, where are we? Yeah, Ruth. Oh. Yes, yes. Can, can folks read that um, in the chat? Right. Mm -hmm. The cross that was the symbol of suffering and shame became the sign of liberation from sin and death for me. Let's go. Thanks for the class. Um, but yes, thank you. Thank you, June Ruth. And for, for that other element of how we still have state-sponsored terrorism, it's called capital punishment. Um, and yes, I know you might disagree, but <laughs> I still think it's state-sponsored terrorism. Um, and so, so there's that. So I, I you know, th there's that. Uh, thank you, Jen Ruth, who's not with us right now. She had to leave, but uh, thank you for, for adding that. Um, so how, you know, all the stuff that we were talking about, about the, 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 the powers and uh, how, how does the cross speak to those situations? How does this cross speak to, you know, children being, you know, to, to have a, a actual bomb go into a train station with named on it for the children? <laughs> how how can how can somebody do that? That that horror, right? And how does the cross speak to that, right? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Mother Limbo, how does the cross speak to that? <laughs> yeah. Well, 
um, that's the eternal question. Um, so I always am aware that there are two realities. There are two parallel realities. There's the reality of the world, the physical realm, and then there's the spiritual realm. And for me, the cross is about Jesus entering the spiritual realm. And, and the only symbolic language that makes sense to me or helps me with understanding it is to say that in the crucifixion and resurrection, light overcame darkness forever. And that even though darkness happens, it will not, it will not win. It, it has already been defeated. And so although those moments, those horrors, absolutely, sometimes I can't sleep and sometimes I weep, but I know that, that is not, that's not the winner, <laughs> that the light has already overcome the darkness and that in the big picture, one day, God will be all in all. But, but, the, but the, the battle has been won, as they say. You know, I don't like military images, but, but the light has already overcome the darkness. So when we see a dark act, it's, uh, I had a professor once who talked about, um, he was teaching on the book of Revelation. And he said, it's like um, we're living in a time where the snake, someone chopped off the head. And when you chop off the head of a snake, it can't bite you anymore, but it's still moving. And so the dark things that are happening are just the last death throes of the snake. But his head is gone. His power is gone. And the light is gonna, has already won. It's already overcome. And so that's where I find my hope. That when I look at the cross and the resurrection, I think light has overcome. What, uh, Mother Lynn, what is the scripture, the something about the dark, and then it says, but joy cometh in the morning. It's one of the Psalms, weeping may endure through the night, but joy comes through the morning. And also, of course, St. John's Gospel. The darkness, uh, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not been able to overcome. It's not overcome it, right? That's what I was trying to get at, at the, in, in the sermon today when I was just grabbed as we were preparing for this with that little section from um, Zechariah. Uh, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Um, and that, that, that sense of being, you know, to be a prisoner of hope in one sense is to be captivated by hope, right? But the... the by the, the promise of hope is captivating, um, I, I think. How, you know, we, we don't have anything, if we don't hope, we despair, right? Or, or we're optimistic, which is equally problematic, um, but yeah. The other thing that I've noticed, because I, I spend a lot of time just watching life, <laughs> Um, and, and, and the other thing that you notice, if you watch anything of darkness that happens, you wait a little while and resurrection happens. Somebody else mentioned that about how, you know, we have our Good Fridays, but we always, always Easter comes. And so if you watch the pattern in life around you, you will see constant um, reminders of death and resurrection. And so once that battle was won, once light overcame darkness, then that became the pattern for all of reality, that although there's death, there is resurrection, no matter what. So you watch long enough, you'll see the resurrection. What Mother Lynn just said about light and darkness. I had a friend. Um, he was a big time businessman, but he overextended himself, and no bank would uh, extend credit to him. 
So he didn't know what to do. So I told him I could help him. And he said, okay, but the first thing he started asking, because we're friends, how much are you going to charge me? And <laughs> so I told him, I says, if that's going to stop you from getting a loan, go find it somewhere else. Well, he was raised and he's a practicing Catholic and he went to his priest and his priest was talking with him. And uh, that Good Friday, um, I was in church. When I got home, my mom was crying. So I said, what happened? He says, uh, Omar killed himself. I said, what? On Good Friday, he had no more hope. And his priest at his funeral service said it. He said he saw darkness and he couldn't come out of it. He had no more hope. There was no more light for him. And when you said that, I remembered that event. It is true. A lot of people have no hope. And it is very sad. Christian work in the world is to be the harbingers of hope. So I mean, maybe that's the question about how, how do we make the cross seem relevant to the world? Gloria Flowers is saying to everyone, the cross is death on one hand, but hope on the other. Thank you, Gloria. Russ, go ahead, Russ. I, I want to just go back a quick step. <clears throat> I really related deeply to what Deacon Margaret said. And in fact, I was made me cry. What you said about knowing, not knowing who we are, and I, uh, <clears throat> I just have to share this incident. Incidents. I think it's really was an amazing something that happened to me. My grandmother sent me photographs of her relatives, my relatives, uh, in the coal mines in Wales, and there were six and seven and eight year old children working in the mines, and half of them who went in the mines were crushed and killed and never got out. <laughs> And everybody died by the time they were 30 from black lung disease. And I was sitting with these photographs that I just opened up at San Francisco State with an African-American friend of mine. And she said, why are you crying? And I showed her these pictures. And I said, it's, it's, she said, I know why you're crying. And I said, why am I crying? She says, because you got out and you know, I didn't. I still don't know where I came from, but you got out. And, and one of the things that's helped me the most in life, not because I'm smart or anything like that, is just knowing um, that we got out of that and we got out of that because I have skin that's this color. And my family, when they came here, they weren't Catholic or Jewish. I, kn I know what's happened to me. And I think that if, when we know that, there's a whole extra thing. And, and so I want to thank you, Deacon Margaret, because that I'm still feeling teary from what you said. And I, I just wanted to, uh, I don't know, give you a thumbs up or something like that. Thank you, Russ. Uh, as we're getting ready to close, a couple of things, but but does anybody have, what, what would somebody say? If somebody, if you, if you had to speak to someone evangelically about the cross, in our world today, what, what would you say to them about that? I didn't have anything to say about that. I didn't have anything to say about that, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to have, um, just before we leave, I want somebody to say something happy and uplifting <laughs> because this has been kind of a downer this whole <laughs> hour. I'll I'm say something you didn't have uplifting, that story. You're I not doing it? You just want somebody to say it? <laughs> Father Mark, I'll say it. That was one of the happiest moments of my life with those photographs. Okay, well, it was a you know, wonderful moment that I I'm, think, it was a gift. 
when I think of the cross, I do a lot of times think of it in the terms of uh, what is Abelard and Tybalt, where you say, you know, God puts us in this world and there's a lot of bad things that could happen to us, you know, and wh why didn't he, you know, why didn't he just make Saturn with the pretty rings and things like that? Why didn't he make, why did he make a world where there's all these, all this, at least that could have been, he knew that that could have happened, that suffering. So God um, participates in that. But that, that isn't, um, so that's how I think of the, um, you know, the God in a sense takes his own medicine. He puts us in this world. There's a lot of suffering that might happen to us. Um, he asks us to be good even so. Um, and he took his own medicine. <laughs> he came and, and experienced that the same way as us. But what I'm still thinking, what I was hoping that somebody would say something very uplifting to take, to leave us with. Well, I'm sure we will. <laughs> Actually, I do. So I was on a, a sort of blind date, and uh, there's a very tall gentleman, and he was saying, uh, well, miracles, there's no miracle. I don't have any miracles. And I said, you know what? Miracles are all around us. They're not hard to find. Pain and suffering is all around us, but so are the miracles. I mean, they're, they're just everywhere. This service was a miracle for all of us, and I'm the only Christian in the th four of us that came. I mean, it was just so beautiful and so stunning and so spiritual and so hopeful. And um, the fact that we represent this many continents and this many different religions and this many different ages and um, sexuality and, you know, it's just, it's amazing. We are so lucky to be here. We are so lucky to be here. This is this place has changed my life, and I've only been here three times. All right, here's your present. You want it happy. Father Mark has given us not just food for thought, but a banquet, a smorgasbord. And Mother Lynn said something fun, um, about darkness being defeated forever. So here's your gift. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you, Deacon Margaret. <laughs> Mother Lynn, you have something else? Did you have one other thing to say? Yeah, I just tapped it a little something because that that whole thing about evil and why did god make the world that way and i asked myself that's for quite a number of years and then one day i just i understood i guess that god wanted us to be free to choose to love god or not and because god set up creation to give us the freedom to choose love or not that means some people are going to choose not. And their behavior, we have to bear. Just as Christ bore the sin of the people around him and he was crucified, we have to bear the pain of other people's choices. And, and so that's, and, and that's the only way we can truly love God. Otherwise, we'd just be puppets. God would pull a string and we would love you know, but God doesn't want that kind of relationship with us. God wants us to love genuinely from our heart because we want to. And that's why. And that's why. No. Nobody wants to be forced to once. What love is it if, if somebody has to be forced to love is the, the comment that was made. You know, and even, you know, this Tebow, this guy, you know, simple, uneducated huntsman. Uh, says, well, God could have kept the pro locked the prodigal son up in his room, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> I, I do want to close this um, because this is the end of our our series today, and we don't have um, anything scheduled by design. Um, 
because I, I just wanted to give us just a minute, um, well, uh, just literally four minutes until one o'clock, which we'll totally close out at. Um, if anybody had, um, uh, just broadly, if, if the next series uh, would be something that you want to go back to doing um, Bible study of a particular book of the Bible, or if you want to do a particular theme for Christian education, um, what would float your boat? Uh, and you can take a second to think about that, uh, except that we will end at one o'clock in four minutes. So you have four minutes to think about that um, if you have some ideas. I mean, if not, then you can also get those you know, to, to me afterwards, right? Um, in an email or, or come up and see me or whatever. But if you have them right now, uh, I'd be glad to entertain any of those thoughts, including people who are on the other side of the circle. Um, how about the Psalms? Very good. We, we did a Psalms once before, but we only talked about the Psalms of Lament. So maybe we can talk about some of the other Psalms, or, uh, some of the more joyful Psalms, maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't, I'm thinking maybe uh, we might try to deviate into something like uh, church history. And uh, I was wondering, maybe we could do something about uh, the history of good and bad of the church when it comes to social activism. That's, that's a good point. In fact, I was thinking of a book, by the way, uh, Rob. Um, I think it's written by Adrian Goldsworthy, who is a classicist. I think that's the author. But it's called Dominion. And it's um, sort of, he, he's a secular, very prominent Roman historian. But but his, his uh, book is, is countering all of the narratives from um, the, the folks who... Uh, have an atheistic axe to grind as a historian saying, wait a minute, that's not what happened. <laughs> um, the, the church is what changed the Roman Empire. And, and uh, you, you're, you're, right, you're rewriting what I know is a, as a secular historian to be true. Um, so that, that's, um, that maybe, maybe that, and of course, there's the contrary as well, but, but um, but yes, yeah, so, so maybe that's an idea. I think Felicia. I would like to do either the book of John or the book of Revelation. I've done three studies on Revelation and Revelation is a challenging book, but I, I, it's, it's one that I really love and I just love John period, so. I mean, we're saying John's church. Should we do something on the Gospel of John, right? Um, and the Book of Revelation is always quite something. Uh, yeah. Mary. Yes, a long time ago we did it, right? Father Mark, I think Mary. Oh, has yes, to... Russ. Oh, Mary. Mary, please. Um, Stephanie Speller's uh, book, "The Church Cracked Open." Is, so do a book study is what you're thinking. Um, possibly it's an excellent book on church history, particularly the Episcopal Church, but the broader church as well. Um, I've only read about two thirds of it so far, but. And she's from our own Episcopal. Uh, well, Dominion might be, too. Yes. So, the yeah, thank you for that. But, a, but it's an excellent book. Would, would folks also, um, with some of these wonderful ideas, just drop me an email also um, so that we can, can think about them? And, and we don't necessarily have to do them, you know, all at the same time, obviously. Uh, we, can, we can put them in. But these are all great ideas because sometimes, you know, I, I, um, I come up with these things and uh, don't know how they're going to fly or if they're going to stick to the wall or whatever. Um, but uh, but it's good to hear these things. So um, thank you. And, you know, some of these also, you know, um, we can also not, some things could be done not on Sunday morning as well. Like, you know, like Mother Lynn has done this wonderful class on uh, the Thursdays in Lent um, on that book uh, by Mark Wazidi Jones on the spirituals. Uh, and that was, has been quite a fruitful class from what I understand, Mother Lynn. Um, so uh, there's that as well. So uh, many choices. Well, thank you all for your ideas. 
Um, we, we need to end now that it, it's 101. I went uh, one minute over my, my covenanted time. Um, and uh, so thank you all. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, um, upward and onward. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>